in the rule of law. In many situations where atrocities are being committed, a climate of impunity has fueled a cycle of violence, and that includes protracted crises such as Syria, Myanmar, uh, Yemen, and of course the recent devastation in the occupied Palestinian territories. Achieving justice remains extremely challenging in all these cases. So today we hope to explore the historic importance of ensuring accountability for atrocity crimes wherever and whenever they occur. And the International Criminal Court has been described as the legal arm of R2P. And today we have the distinct honor and privilege to host the Chief Prosecutor of the ICC, Madam Fatou Bensouda, as our keynote speaker. However, before we proceed, I'd like to give the floor to Ambassador Geraldine Byrne Nason, Permanent Representative of Ireland to the United Nations for some opening remarks. She has to leave afterwards to go to the UN Security Council. So we thank her very much for taking time out to come here and make these remarks. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. It's always a pleasure to be with you and particularly a pleasure to once again partner with the Global Centre for the responsibility to protect on the annual 11 Sanun Lecture, a really important occasion in our, in our calendar. And the theme of this year's event, focusing on accountability, really frankly goes to the heart of Ireland's foreign policy priorities and certainly, I can tell you, is at the core of our work as a newly elected member of the Security Council. For me, as Ireland's representative on the Council, our ensuring accountability means that we actively and determinedly step up for the promotion of the rule of law and for upholding human rights. I see it as fighting against impunity. It means supporting the International Criminal Court and it certainly sees the role of the court as critical to the independent and impartial approach that we need to bring to these core issues. And that's why I'm really honored and very much delighted uh, to welcome Ms. Fatou Bin Souda, ICC prosecutor as our keynote speaker today. And I'm thrilled that I actually both professionally and personally have this opportunity to thank her for her courageous, her fearless, and her impartial work over the last nine years of her term as the ICC prosecutor. It's good to see you again, Ms. Bensouda. We see you regularly in the Security Council. We have deep respect for the work you have done. For today's lecture, we also have a, an exciting and an outstanding panel of experts. And I know we will learn so much uh, as we listen to them and as we look importantly, to the impact and the importance of accountability in, in building peace and importantly, in sustaining peace. I'm thrilled uh, that I have a good friend here with us this morning, James Kingston, uh, Mr. James Kingston, who is Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs legal advisor. Um, it's great that James will, will join us and expand, I think, on the importance that Ireland affords to accountability, not least, as I mentioned earlier, in the work we're currently engaged in on the Security Council. I'm also very happy to welcome Dr. Karen Smith, the Special Representative for Responsibility to Protect, along with, of course, uh, Simon, Dr. Simon Adams, who is the well-known Executive Director of the Global Centre for Responsibility to Protect. Look, I think, uh, Simon, you touched on it in your introduction. I don't think we're short on the global stage these days of examples uh, to show just how we are accountable to and accountable for each other. And surely if anything uh, illustrates that for us, it must be the pandemic um, and it shows us uh, that accountability to and for each other in spades currently. And um, it's proved beyond any doubt, I think that uh, when facing common challenges, challenges really without borders, we really have no alternative uh, but to work together. Um, I keep returning myself every day as we work on the Security Council to the opening words of the UN Charter, and those are we, the word we, the very first word of the Charter is about the collective. And we come together as individual member states to combine our strength, our capacities, to construct a path of peace and stability, to champion collaboration over isolation, and frankly, to prefer cooperation over self-interest. 
Um, but we must recognise, of course, that that collaboration, frankly, goes nowhere if it remains at the declaratory, declaratory level. There, there can be a reluctance to hold each other to account. The consciousness of, of the imperfections in our own societies, which can make us hesitate sometimes to speak out clearly, even when we know we should. We see that on a regular basis uh, internationally, the international community has uh, held itself to the mirror and recognized that many times. Since we came on the council, I recognize that in Syria, I recognize it in Yemen, I recognize it in, in Tigray. However, if we are to ensure that the words never again, the words in the charter, truly have a meaning, it means that we must use our voice. And that's also why Ireland is particularly active and supports the ACT Code of Conduct, which pledges the council members to act to prevent crimes such uh, as well as indeed supporting the, the Franco-Mexican initiative on restricting the use of the veto, where we have collectively failed to hold up our responsibility to protect, the very least we can do is to ensure that there is accountability. Last week, uh, the Security Council heard from the UN investigative team to promote accountability for crimes committed by ISIL, and yesterday, the prosecutor spoke to us in the council also about work, the work of the court in Libya. The work of these missions demonstrate the importance of the Security Council itself coming together to ensure accountability for atrocity crimes and how that accountability is essential to healing the wounds of conflict and to moving on to build that sustainable peace I mentioned. So frankly, if we're to fulfill our mandate, the imperative really must be that cooperative action. Um, and we cannot, frankly, um, allow prevention, conflict prevention to rest at the prevention phase. It must be about rebuilding. And for that, in our view, accountability is absolutely key. So with those words and um, my sincere apologies that I can't enjoy the entire rich discussion I know that's ahead, as I must go to the council, I want to wish you all an excellent panel discussion, an excellent, uh, I'm sure, presentation from Ms. Ben Souda, and to thank you again at the Global Centre for all of the extraordinary work you do on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for those welcoming words, and thank you for everything you're doing on the Council. To uh, It's a little bit of a cliche these days, but to speak truth to power is still an enormously important thing, and I think that's what Ireland is doing at the, at the Council. I'd now like to share some remarks from uh, the Honourable Gareth Evans via video recording before we proceed with the keynote address. I think it's a huge honour and a privilege to have this annual lecture given in my name and that of our late and wonderful friend and colleague, Mohammed Sanoon. And I couldn't be more delighted to have this year's lecture delivered by Fatou Bensouda, the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who has for the last nine years done an absolutely fantastic job in circumstances that we all know have been often impossibly trying. As we watch with frustrated horror new atrocity crimes being perpetrated in Myanmar and in Gaza, and as we see the continuing ugliness of the situations in Syria, Yemen and elsewhere, it's never been more important that we make operationally effective that normative commitment that the world's leaders made to the responsibility to protect at the Global Summit, the World Summit in 2005. And if we are to make R2P a reality, there are few, if any, more important institutions than the ICC, which for all the forces that are trying to inhibit its effectiveness has fundamentally changed the calculations made by would-be perpetrators of mass atrocity crimes. They know that their impunity from the reach of international law can no longer be guaranteed. Fatou's voice and achievements will live on and she can be very proud of the legacy that she will leave. 
I'm Morris Thinks, uh, finally to Simon Adams and all my colleagues at the Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect for the enormous contribution that you continue to make to keeping alive the spirit in the letter of R2P. And my particular thanks again this year to the Government of Ireland and its very distinguished cast of diplomats in New York for all your continuing support, not least in sponsoring this lecture. It really is a huge pleasure and privilege to work with you all in our continuing efforts to eliminate from the face of the earth once and for all genocide, other crimes against humanity, major war crimes, those mass atrocity crimes which not only cause so much unconscionable death, injury and misery, but do continue to shame our common humanity. Thank you to Gareth Evans for that message. And uh, now it is my very great honor to introduce Madam Fatou Bensouda, the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who will deliver the keynote address. Over to you, Madam Bensouda. Uh, you're on mute, sorry. It's not a real Zoom seminar, and if somebody leaves themselves on, on mute. So there we go. There we go, yes. So I'm trying to, yes, I think it's going right now. Yes, you are, you are, we can hear you now. Yes, indeed. I, I always have some, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, I, I first of all want to, um, of course, thank uh, the uh, uh, Global Center for Responsibility to Protect uh, and the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations for inviting me to deliver the Evans Sahnoon lecture this year and to join a, a panel with such distinguished speakers and friends, and if I may more broadly, for the principal support and assistance extended to me and my office over the years. Um, I, I, I would not proceed without uh, giving uh, special thanks to Ireland and uh, for the very consistent support that has been given to my office and to myself personally uh, over the years during my mandate. Um, uh, to thank Ireland for the strong statements of support uh, yesterday, in fact, by the foreign minister at the Amsterdam dialogues uh, that uh, um, I spoke at. And also, as I mentioned to permanent representative Nason just now for yesterday at the Security Council um, uh, for the, for the at, when I briefed the Security Council, I'm very, very grateful for all these supportive uh, remarks. Uh, thank you also to Gareth uh, um, for, for the support I have also received uh, from him over the years and for being uh, such uh, an inspiring uh, international personality for, for all of us. Um, dear friends, it must be recalled at the outset that the atrocities which shocked the conscience of humanity in the past century, prompted the international community to make a collective commitment and indeed to take decisive action to, to check the destructive power of lawless wars. In that pivotal moment in our collective modern history, the responsibility to protect R2P and the International Criminal Court, the ICC, both emerged as manifestations of the global community's determination to end impunity for atrocity crimes and to promote a culture of accountability with a view to protect citizens and to prevent future crimes. Today, as we look at the state of the world and consider the situations governed by conflict, the suffering from ongoing violence and the rife with gross human rights violations this convergence is as important as ever. As, I, as was stated by the UN Secretary General in the recent report on advancing atrocity prevention 
and the work of the Office on Gen Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing vulnerabilities and created new protect protection challenges with a surge in stigmatization and hate speech and increased excitement and violence towards minorities. In addition to more flagrant disregard for well-established principles of international law, with more frequent instances of deliberate targeting of schools and hospitals, the destruction of heritage sites and the widespread sexual and gender-based crimes. This renders the continued principled and consistent application of R2P and ICC norms a necessity. It is no coincidence that R2P has been invoked in many UN Security Council resolutions relating to crises that have also have the attention of my office and the court as a whole, including regarding the situations in the Central African Republic, in Libya and Mali, to name a few. But there are many more situations that merit vigilance. A consistent, principled, and carefully calibrated approach by the Security Council to instances of atrocity crimes can go a long way in reducing great human suffering in times of war. And that includes a responsible exercise of the veto based on clear guidelines and code of conduct, as some have suggested, to ensure that the Council is not effectively blocked due to politics from duly addressing real instances where atrocity crimes or the potential for their commission threaten international peace and security. At the ICC Office of the Prosecutor, we have witnessed a steady increase in demands with calls for our intervention from all corners of the globe during the past nine years of my term. And we approach such calls with professionalism and de dedication, with independence and impartiality, and without fear or favor, always guided by the dictates of the Rome Statute, the information available and the evidence that emerges from our activities. And it is as such that my office is currently seized of eight situations under preliminary examinations to determine in accordance with the strict legal criteria of the Rome Statute, if investigations should be initiated. And these criteria take into account the court's complementary nature, meaning that the office will defer to domestic proceedings where appropriate. In practice, the office's approach to complementarity creates a dynamic interaction with domestic authorities and other actors with whom the office engages constructively where possible with a view to jointly achieving justice for the victims and affected communities in a given situation. The preliminary examinations we are currently conducting include the situations in Bolivia, Colombia, Guinea, the Philippines, and Venezuela, where we have just completed our preliminary examinations with respect to the situations in Nigeria and Ukraine, with the determination that the criteria for opening investigations are met. The office is currently considering its next steps in those situations, taking into account a number of strategic, legal, and resource related considerations, and in anticip anticipation of the arrival next month of my successor, Mr. Karim Khan, with whom we are engaged in a series of transition talks to prepare him in the best possible way for the handover of the office. And we are in parallel conducting active investigations, meaning we are collecting evidence in order to establish persons most responsible for the commission of the crimes alleged in nine situations, including in Mali, in Bangladesh, Myanmar, the Central African Republic, Libya, Darfur, Sudan, and Georgia. In Afghanistan, we engaged in a process of consultations with the government of Afghanistan in light of its request to the office to defer to its efforts to address Rome statute crimes domestically. I received a high level delegation led by the Afghan Minister of Foreign Affairs earlier this month. We found the discussions were very productive and the meeting provided an occasion for detailed presentations giving further insights into investigative steps 
taken or planned by the national authorities in Afghanistan and an opportunity for my office to seek clarifications on a number of discussion points. My decision in relation to the government's request is pending. With respect to the situation in Palestine, my office recently announced the opening of an investigation following the judicial clarity provided by the judges of the pretrial chamber earlier this year upon my office's application regarding the scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction in that situation. As we are planning our investigative efforts, I note with great concern, the escalation of violence. I have echoed work calls from the international community for calm, restraint and a stop to the violence. We take serious the court's preventive mandate and endeavor across situations to enhance the impact of the office's activities as part of wider prevention efforts by the international community, including by making public statements where necessary to remind parties of the court's jurisdiction and put would-be perpetrators on notice. Besides the preliminary examinations and investigations, my office is currently preparing for or conducting an unprecedented number of prosecution cases in court concerning alleged perpetrators from Darfur, Central African Republic, Mali, and Kenya. This, of course, is what the ICC was ultimately created for, to prosecute and adjudicate cases with a view to establishing the truth surrounding events and rendering a measure of justice for the victims and affected communities. It is also the most significant way to impact and contribute to changes in the calculus and behavior of individuals, including those who commit or intend to commit atrocity crimes. The performance of my office in court has been an important focus of efforts instigated at the beginning of my term as prosecutor and continued throughout the nine years of my mandate to strengthen the organization and its results. Significant changes were undertaken under my direction concerning strategic approaches, organizational management, and internal office culture. In court, our focus has been on quality rather than quantity to secure successes. And during my term, the office has achieved a number of important litigation results and landmark decisions, such as the ruling delivered in the Myanmar Bangladesh situation, confirming the court's jurisdiction over the alleged deportation of Rohingya people and the appellate ruling on head of state immunity in the Al-Bashir case in the Darfur Sudan situation. We have also secured important convictions that do not only contribute to delivering justice to victims of mass atrocities, but also to the development of international criminal law jurisprudence. For example, in the Taganda case, emanating from our investigations in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, my office secured the conviction of the accused on all counts, including for the first time in the court's history, the crime of sexual slavery, as well as the crime of rape against women and men. Through this case, we have contributed to emerging jurisprudence by extending the protection under international humanitarian law to also cover crimes committed by an armed group against members of their own group. The Al-Mahdi case, following our investigations in the situation in Mali, sent a clear message that the int intentional attacks against historic monuments and buildings dedicated to religion is a serious crime under international law. And this message was widely recognized and amplified as it reverberated through a variety of international actors, including UNESCO and also the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. My office is currently finalizing a policy paper devoted to this topic, which shall be launched prior to my departure. We are grateful for the various comments and input we received from stakeholders to the draft we put out for comment last month. And we are equally finalizing a policy on situation completion, the last in a trilogy of policies following that on preliminary examinations and, the, and on the case selection and prioritization. 
and I consider the promulgation of policy papers a critical part of my legacy as prosecutor. Indeed, my office, through its prosecution activities and policy work, can provide helpful clarifications of the legal framework and make a unique contribution in the fight against impunity, in particular for those crimes that are typically underreported or insufficiently addressed at the domestic level, such as sexual and gender-based crimes, crimes against or affecting children, and crimes against cultural heritage. We previously elevated the first two issues to key priorities under the office's strategic plans and adopted comprehensive policy papers to highlight the importance of addressing these crimes, to elaborate on the applicable legal framework, take a systematic approach to the prosecution of these crimes and to provide a reference to the extent that our work and best practices can be helpful to efforts at the national level. A final case example in this context is the conviction we secured of Dominic Ongwen in relation to the Uganda situation on 61 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity, which included important convictions on the basis of sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children, including for the first time, the crimes of forced marriage and forced pregnancy. He was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment earlier this month. Through these decisions, the court sends an important message globally that perpetrators of atrocities must be and will be held accountable. Step by step, the court is showing results in the service of its crucial mandate. It is an arduous task, but with time, greater resources and even more experience built on the strength of our resilient and dedicated staff, coupled with growing influence and support, the court will further sharpen as an essential tool in the R2P toolbox to reach its apex. To be sure, the court and justice in general are part of the R2P, as the UN Secretary General has also confirmed in the past. They are the R2P's legal arm. Your Excellencies, the ICC and R2P must be supported and strengthened as vital instruments in the enforcement of a culture of accountability and long-term prevention of atrocity crimes. I have personally met on regular occasions and benefited from exchanges with the UN Special Advisors, including for many years, my dear friend Adam Ajeng, whose term as Special Advisor on Genocide Prevention largely coincided with my time in office. And this exchange can be further enhanced and institutionalized to benefit mutually from information gathering and sharing and analysis conducted in both our offices to strengthen early warning and prevention. The international community as a whole can strengthen its response to emergencies and conflict and ensure wider legal protection for their citizens and enhance deterrence, including by increasing the number of ratifications to the Rome Statute and ensuring domestication of its provisions through implementing legislation. Recent years have also seen an increased importance of civil society actors, not only as courageous change agents by advocating for accountability and preventive action by the international community, but also in terms of acting as first responders and preserving and sharing evidence with the national or international accountability mechanisms and courts. States should consider ways to protect and support these actors as well under the framework of R2P. The timely and effective arrest and surrender of individuals against whom ICC has issued warrants may similarly contribute to reconciling societies where such individuals would otherwise continue to wreak havoc. The court and the ICC states parties together with civil society also have a unique opportunity before them as they are actively considering ways to strengthen the fun functioning of the court and the wider Rome statute system as part of the ongoing review process. And the court has engaged in this process proactively and transparently 
as an occasion to further hone its performance. The new leadership of the Assembly of States Parties and the court, including the incoming prosecutor, can give further impetus to this momentum. States too should rise to the occasion and honor their commitment by respecting their share of the burden, ideally through greater contributions in operational, political, and financial terms to ensure the, the realization of the Rome Statute system full potential. And practice and experience has demonstrated that ICC, much like the R2P, works and can work more robustly for the benefit of victims and humanities progress if it is increasingly supported as a perhaps uncomfortable but necessary mechanism in the fight against impunity for atrocity crimes. I also wish to state that to me, there is no greater perversion of virtue than the politicization or the weaponization of human rights to gain political advantage. Genuine supporters of international criminal justice and R2P must be on guard against these ills and insulate and protect these important concepts from both the machinations and overreach of politics, but also the naivety or the often destructive potential of the so-called moral clarity and absolutism of the overzealous and the ideological. International criminal justice and the R2P must be advanced correctly and in a principled manner to achieve their intended objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friends, these are uncertain times with governments facing competing priorities in a diffused, even confused multilateral order. And in this world, there are too many situations where populations are experiencing or at risk of atrocities. And what is needed today, therefore, is a greater support for the ICC, the R2P, and the international rule of law, not less. We must stand firm in our resolve and speak with one voice that the commission of mass atrocities as merely politics by other means will no longer receive a pass and that perpetrators, irrespective of rank or official status, must answer their crimes. We must dispel dishonest, dishonest attacks or deliberate misrepresentation of the court's work and mandate. We must continue to work for the victims of atrocity crimes who look at the court as a last beacon of hope. I have entered my last month as the prosecutor of the ICC. During my term, I have done everything in my power to, to honor the trust and the responsibility bestowed upon me by the state's parties by implementing the crucial prosecutorial mandate to the best of my ability, always in accordance with legal confines of the Rome Statute, with integrity, independence and impartiality and the plight of victims and affected communities in mind, and I will continue to do so even in these final days until my term runs out. That is what was expected of me when I was elected into office, not to make easy decisions, but to take the right decisions. And what is right must never be sacrificed at the altar of political expediency. Protecting citizenry from the scourge of unrestrained war and conflict does not demonstrate weakness, it demonstrates leadership. And I thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the exchange. Thank you so much, Chief Prosecutor, for, for such a uh, substantial and moving keynote address. And uh, certainly you've been such an incredible champion of human rights and international justice and the whole period of your tenure including, a, you know, obviously at a time when the court has been under such attack from, from political enemies. And at one point, you were even personally sanctioned yourself by people who will remain nameless. Yes. Um, so we, we really do thank you. We have a very distinguished panel that will join us now to further elaborate on this discussion and on the points raised by the Chief Prosecutor. A, a big welcome <clears throat> to uh, Ms. Karen Smith, 
UN Special Advisor on the Responsibility to Protect, and Mr. James Kingston, Legal Advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland. It's a, it's a pleasure to have both of you with us. Uh, let, let me start with a, a question, which I'll direct, of course, to the Chief Prosecutor, but I'd like to get the other panel members to, to respond maybe as well. Uh, and, it, and it's this, as you approach the time when, when you'll obviously step down very soon as Chief Prosecutor of the Court, do you feel that the arm of international justice has got stronger or weaker over the last decade? Have we made progress in the, in the battle against impunity? I know you touched on that in your lecture, but what's your feeling personally as an individual? Um, uh, thank you, Simon, for that. Um, and again, I reiterate my pleasure in joining such a distinguished panel and panel members. Um, um, I, I think that the challenges that we, we, we face will be there. It is because of the nature of what we do. Um, the nature of it, what we do is to hold people accountable for such serious crimes, atrocity crimes. So we will continue to have uh, challenges. I, I think one of the, um, uh, uh, the biggest challenges that I've seen uh, in the past recent years is this challenge to multilateralism itself. Um, I, I, I believe that this has uh, received tremendous uh, attacks and pushback. Uh, but then again, this is where we, we need to hold on and stand firm and stand firm and always ensure that uh, we continue to uh, advocate for and promote for the rule of law um, internationally. This is, uh, this is critical. If we allow the pushback uh, and not show, show resilience, to this attack that we, it's, I mean, I, I think in your, in your remarks, you will, you will agree with me that there is serious attacks on, on multilateralism and uh, also challenges to the rule of law. And uh, unfortunately also we see that uh, conflicts are sprouting everywhere. It is, it is very unfortunate, but this is uh, something that we see and uh, it, it doesn't mean that we have to step back. We, we need to push forward. We need to continue with the resolve we had to say that these very serious crimes will be addressed. Uh, we will look for ways to protect those who are victims of these crimes. We will also look to hold those who, who uh, commit these crimes accountable. We will seek to prevent would be perpetrators from committing, the, committing these crimes and act as a deterrence in that way, but also to, to signal very strongly that the rule of law, the protection that we owe to those who would, the victims or would be victims is not going to wane, that we are standing firm because these attacks will continue. They will not stop. Um, there will always, there will always be uh, those who are out there who are seeking to, to indeed make sure that we do not live up to this responsibility to protect those who need our protection. Those of us who are in a position to do that must not lose hope. On the other hand, we should stand firm in the face of all these attacks. Thank you, Chief Prosecutor. And I'll, I'll bring in now uh, Special Advisor Smith, same question. Karen, what's your view on, on this? Thanks, Simon. And I just, of course, also want to thank the Global Centre and the, the Irish Mission to the UN for, for organising this very important event. And, and thanks again to, uh, to Ms. Ben Suda for, for taking the time to, to share her thoughts and I think on, uh, about this really important topic. And um, I'm glad that you know, we, can, we have this opportunity to speak about how the responsibility to protect and the International Criminal Court really um, you know, have the same goal. Um, and how they are related and how they really are complementary to one another. Now, to your question, you know, I think, I think you know, we can't get around the fact that, yes, the fight against impunity is not getting easier. And, and for many of the reasons that have been mentioned, including broader issues around, uh, you know, challenges to, to, um, human, to the human rights regime or generally challenges to multilateralism. Um, and so, 
also, you know, we, we, it, it feels as though the, the, the cases of atrocity crimes around the world is, is simply on the increase. Um, and in all of these cases, of course, the UN has been looking at options for accountability, but the challenges are huge. Um, and in this fight against impunity, the establishment of the ICC was undoubtedly a major breakthrough. Uh, and the court has played a fundamental role in the pursuit of justice. And I'd like to say that despite the challenges and the criticism that it faces, it will continue to do so. However, I also want to note that we must not forget, as the chief prosecutor outlined in her, in her speech, that the ICC is intended to play a complementary role to that of national jurisdictions. So, you know, as we look at the broader topic of what can be done to enhance accountability and, and support for the ICC, I also want to emphasize that just as states have the primary responsibility to protect their populations from atrocity crimes, they also have the primary responsibility to see that justice is served. Um, and there have been several efforts to assist and facilitate national prosecutions, including by the ICC itself, uh, as well as by the UN and, and other international and regional organizations and civil society actors. Um, and I'm emphasizing this because we need to invest more in the development of national capacities. Uh, and in this regard, it's important to promote uh, national legislation related to atrocity crimes, stronger partnerships between the different actors involved and more effective cooperation as well as greater synergies between national and international efforts. And so in cases where accountability at the national level is not possible, of course, the ICC remains an essential instrument for ensuring accountability. But for this, we also need the international community to continue to support this institution in the spirit in which it was established. And I'd like to emphasize what others have already said, that this includes that the Security Council needs to do more in its role to ensure accountability through referring situations to the court, because failing to do so only perpetuates the cycle of impunity at the expense of victims. Thanks, Simon. Thank you for that, Karen. And, and same question also to uh, Mr. James Kingston, who's, who's here from via Cork, but now in, in Dublin uh, to speak on this topic as well. Uh, listen, thank you very much, uh, Simon, Dr. Adams. I'd like to thank you, the Centre, and in particular, Jahal and Christine, for, for all their help in, in, in making this event happen. Um, it's great to have been, however, briefly uh, in the same video chat as Geraldine byrne Nason, Ambassador, uh, a dear friend and longstanding colleague, and a great honour to speak alongside uh, Karen, um, and, of course, a particular pleasure to have heard what the prosecutor had to say. Um, I think it's fair to say that Ms. Bensouda is uh, the legal arm of R2P in many ways. Um, and over the past decade and more, in fact, uh, her expertise, competence, courage, and above all her dignity in the face of attack is really an example to us all. Um, and we really look forward to welcoming her back to Ireland uh, when she completes her, her mandate. So, Gaurav Mahagat, uh, Madam Prosecutor, thank you. Um, so, I'm just going to focus now, of course, on the question that you put to me. But um, my remarks should all be seen, I think, through the prism of Ireland's core commitment to accountability as one of its three principal priorities as a member of the Security Council. So, in relation to um, R2P itself, it has, I would say, multiple legal arms, but the ICC is its strong right arm. 10 years ago, the court itself was nearly 10 years old. Um, it had done much in its first decade and it has continued to grow and to develop its muscles um, in its second decade. And I think we should be confident and certainly hopeful that there will be further progress in the current and following decades, but of course, only if we all in the international community help it. If we support the court, it will go stronger as it grows into to adulthood. Um, I think we should all acknowledge, uh, and Mrs. Bensuda, I hope, would confirm this, the court isn't perfect, uh, but the number of preliminary examinations, situations, cases, arrest warrants, accused persons, convictions and acquittals, and I'll say that again, acquittals, is testament to its growing strength and maturity. Um, we don't know what the state of international justice will be if there were no ICC. Uh, but we certainly know that despite numerous setbacks, 
the court and the international community has suffered in recent years, the court, the ICC, continues to do its work with integrity and impartiality and is becoming a permanent feature of international criminal justice in reality and not just on paper. So the international community, we have given the ICC a mandate to fulfill and we must assist it to do that. Cooperation uh, with the court by states parties is of course crucial in enabling the ICC to do its work. But we also need support from other states and in that regard, I think most of you would join me if not all of you in, in welcoming recent moves by the United States government, by the Biden administration to come closer to the court as it has been in the past. And my government certainly warmly welcomes that development. But as well as states, international organizations, of course, the UN, but also regional organizations such as the EU and the African Union are crucial. And so too is civil society. And as somebody who was involved in the immediate post-Rome period, you know, the ICC would not exist uh, if it weren't for civil society. Um, so I guess to sum up, I'd just say that Ireland is a firm, but not unquestioning friend of the court. Um, and during our time on the Security Council, we will do all we can to help the ICC uh, fulfill its, its really important work. Thank you. Thank you for that, James. Um, I've, we've got a lot of questions and I just apologize in advance because there's absolutely no way we're gonna be able to, to get through all of them. But maybe let me put this one to everybody. Uh, this comes from Professor Tom Weiss, who's a, a leading scholar of the UN system that may be known to a, a number of you. He says, given the connection between attacks on immovable cultural heritage and attacks on vulnerable populations, as the ICC's El Mahdi verdict in 2016 demonstrates, and as the UNSC resolution 2347 emphasizes, is the destruction of cultural heritage a crime against humanity as well as a war crime? That, that was a very significant case for the, for the court, Madam Bensouda. Um, and certainly, I think a number of us, as you pointed out in your comments, in, including the Global Centre, really wanted to underline that uh, there's a connection between attacks on people and attacks on cultural heritage. I um, wonder if you'd like to comment on that and any other panellists as well. Um, I, 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 I agree that the, um, the um, um, Al Mahdi case um, was was a was a big success not just for the court, but for also international criminal justice, international criminal law. I I believe, and also um, uh, uh, a huge uh, um, contribution uh, to that uh, uh, th the cr those type of crimes. Um, Al Mahdi, the decision to charge Al Mahdi uh, for other crimes, but specifically for the destruction of cultural heritage, I could say was, was deliberate, um, given the fact that uh, in our assessment, these, uh, these crimes did occur um, in Mali uh, at the time. And you will recall that even prior to Al Mahdi, you would, you would see that it, had, it was becoming more of the norm in most of the situations in the world where um, cultural heritage um, will be willfully destroyed uh, just because they can do it, they're in a position to do it. And I believe that as an international uh, institution with the mandate and with the um, having the, the tools to be able to charge for these uh, crimes under the Rome Statute, we, 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 we decided that it would be important again to send, to, to, to really send a message, a strong message that destruction of these uh, uh, properties, cultural heritage is a crime under the Rome Statute and will be, uh, those who commit it will be held accountable. And uh, this was why uh, we, we charged Al Mahdi for those cases. And uh, he also uh, pleaded uh, guilty for, for the crimes that he has committed and was sentenced. Um, again, I said, this is a very strong message that we need to send that we cannot uh, continue or allow those who, who have the mind to do so to, to destroy uh, cultural heritage at will. Destroying cultural heritage is like destroying the identity of a people. 
the culture of a people, of the people themselves. And this was uh, uh, very much highlight, highlighted and manifested during the course of the Al-Mahdi uh, proceedings. So we, we, again, it's a very serious offense. Um, uh, I tried that we send that message that it is not, not just about destroy, destroying bricks or, 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 or sand or manuscript. It's, it's more than that, much more than that. It is intricately linked to the culture and the heritage of a people, to the identity of a people. And destroying that amounts to very, very serious crimes under the Rome Statute. And uh, we, we decided to, to go ahead and, and, and charge that. Karen or, or James, do either of you want to come in on this? James? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, the prosecutor has really answered the, the question as a matter of international law, you know? Um, crimes against cultural heritage are crimes under the Rome Statute, and, th and that's affirmed by the jurisprudence of the court. But uh, I mean, this isn't a particularly original or a particularly legal thought. You know, human beings can't live by bread alone. Um, culture is what sustains us. Uh, part of our creativity, part of the way we live involves us contributing to our culture, changing it and developing it. Uh, we have to work cooperatively. Uh, and that's a cultural sort of, uh, we all have our own cultural ways of doing that. And um, when I spoke earlier, I said a couple of words in Irish, uh, but only a couple of words. And the reason I can't speak more is partly because for centuries, uh, there were attempts to stop Irish people uh, speaking the Irish language, amongst other, amongst other crimes, if we were talking in, in contemporary terms. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very important to... Uh, to say that, um, you know, I have to admit, you know, lives are complicated. Cultures always change. It's not that cultural change is bad, but an attempt to destroy culture is an attempt to attack humanity itself. Thank you, thank you James. Karen? Yeah, thank you. I, I don't have much more to add to that, except to say that I completely agree that, you know, this is an issue. The destruction of cultural heritage, I think, has not received enough attention in relation to R2P. And I know that the Global Center yourself and of course also Professor Weiss have been doing really important work on this. So I think it's a it's kind of an emerging field that we need to be paying much more attention to because I completely agree with the other speakers that you know it's certainly not just about destroying a building uh, or destroying books. It's really much, much deeper than that. And I think the other thing to, to maybe note as well is that you know the destruction of cultural heritage uh, rarely occurs in isolation from other atrocity crimes, uh, you know, happening at the same time. So, um, so I just like to add that it really is something that we we should be paying much more attention to in the future. No, thank you for that, Karen. And I'm very conscious of the time, so let me try and combine two questions together. Well, this will be difficult, <laughs> and uh, you guys can pick out whatever parts of it uh, uh, you like. Um, there's been a lot of questions here I'm seeing on my screen about Palestine. So this is a kind of a, a, apologies to Catherine uh, Gallagher, but I'm, I'm going to try and edit this a little bit. Um, she asks, what steps are you each taking within your mandates to prevent the commission of crimes against humanity and to protect civilians in Palestine? Noting that the special advisors issued a statement in 2014 and noting that there is a strong prevention element to the prosecutor's mandate. So that's, that's one question. Again, people can have a, have a go at that if they like. There's another question here. Um, uh, again, many, many questions, but let me just, this is from Keith Best. He says, one of the problems around impunity is the failure of certain states to surrender those who have been indicted by the ICC. What is the best way of overcoming this? Is there a need for a further international legislation or is this simply about political commitment from the UN Security Council and others? So uh, I, I'm sure the prosecutor has very strong views on, on both of those issues, yes. but um, I'll also, I'll, so I'll turn to her and then Karen and, and James, if you have anything you want to say about this as well. Um, with respect to the first uh, question um, uh, on, on Palestine and what is being done, um, I, I first of all want to um, highlight uh, my statement of last week um, on the, uh, uh, the unfortunate events that are unfolding in, in, in Palestine 
at the moment. Um, and you will recall that in that statement, I reminded that um, I have already announced the opening of investigations into the situation. Um, by virtue of the, I mentioned it in my presentations when the judges uh, considered the issue of the spoke, scope of territorial jurisdiction um, in March, I, I came out subsequently to say that uh, formally and officially um, ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor was opening investigations into that situation. And that process of course has started. Uh, it's ongoing, we are, we are doing our feasibility studies and we are looking at best strategies in which to investigate into that situation. It comes with its challenges, I, I must say. It comes with, uh, like most investigations, this, this also comes with its challenges, but this doesn't mean that it will uh, stop the office from going, going ahead with the, our legitimate investigations into that situation. In my last uh, statement, the statement of last week, when I, when I reminded that investigations are open. I also highlighted the fact that we are closely monitoring the current events that are unfolding, that are going on. Uh, first, we are calling for calm and, and restraint, but also we are reminding that we will look into, those, into these events that are unfolding at the moment in the course of our investigations. Um, you will you will you will note that uh, um, as a as an investigating office, investigating body, we need to uh, do our investigations independently uh, to obtain the 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 evidence that we need to present before judges. We do take note of what uh, uh, what is in the public domain. Uh, what we are following, but I, I also have to remind that the investigations have also to be done independently by my office. At the moment, what we can do is uh, in the form of deterrent statements, really to, to send statements and to also uh, highlight that events that are holding there could be um, fall within ICC crimes, that the crimes that ICC is able to look at to be able to investigate and also to present. And at the moment, that is what uh, uh, we as a court can do. Um, and this of course has, uh, um, will not uh, either deter or prevent us from continuing with the investigations that have already been opened and to take the necessary steps to ensure that, that those investigations uh, go ahead. Um, with respect to failure to arrest and surrender, um, this, is, this is something that uh, I think uh, we all know has caused a lot of frustration and uh, challenges for the, for the office. And I would al also say for, for really for all the uh, ad hoc and other international or internationalized uh, um, uh, courts and, and tribunals, uh, surrender is always a challenge because the system that uh, we all uh, uh, practice mostly uh, in the international, well, let me speak for ICC, is that we, we have to have a body before the ICC, before trials can proceed. The body must be there, an arrest must take place, and the person surrendered to the, to the ICC and uh, the, the trials will, will begin. Um, we also know the way ICC was created. Uh, we, we cannot uh, forget that. Um, we do our, our legal work, we investigate, we are ready to prosecute, but also the states that have established the ICC have a responsibility to assist, cooperate with the ICC, including arresting individuals and bringing them before the ICC, surrendering them to the ICC. And this is where we have had great difficulties. Um, great difficulties in the sense that uh, um, sometimes it's just very, very difficult, but we know that political considerations have also played a big role in, in the lack of arrest um, and, and, and surrender. Uh, and we have insisted always that where the individual, the person wanted by the ICC finds himself or herself on the territory of a state party, with obligations 
uh, by uh, after ratifying the Rome Statute, a state party has obligations to arrest and surrender. I, I do not need to give the example of what happened in South Africa. I, I believe we are all uh, witnesses to, to that. And in that case, you will remember it was civil society that actually led, led the, uh, um, uh, the, the litigation against the government and to remind the government of its obligation. And in South Africa, if you recall that because the, the Rome Statute provisions have been domesticated, it became a constitutional obligation on the part of the government to arrest and surrender Bashir. Uh, this is not also always the case everywhere. And we have seen several times in which when we seek uh, uh, a person wanted to be arrested, we are given all kinds of explanations why this cannot be done. Um, I, I believe that we need to look into this matter seriously. Uh, we cannot uh, continue as an institution working, investigating, asking judges to issue arrest warrants only to have the warrants uh, um, uh, put aside and never executed. It does not help to prevent uh, uh, these crimes it increases impunity for these crimes. It promotes actually impunity. Another example is in this situation in Libya. Um, we have issued quite a number of warrants of arrest in, in, in the situation in Libya. And recently, um, two of those persons who have been wanted, Erwal Fali and uh, also Al Tuhami, both died. Um, and this prevented justice to be done uh, before the ICC. I, I, I think this, is, this was also a, a grave disappointment to the victims themselves who have suffered at the hands of these who, alleged, who are alleged to have committed these crimes. So this is something that the international community has to look at, especially states parties to the Rome Statute have to look at carefully. If we want this court to be efficient, if, if we want this court to deter, to take action that will deter others from uh, uh, committing these crimes, we need to be serious about cooperating with the ICC, assisting the ICC, and getting persons wanted by the ICC arrested and brought to justice before the ICC. And uh, here I, I am not um, uh, completely uh, disregarding the issue of complementarity, which uh, um, uh, Karen, you mentioned. Of course, one of the cardinal principles of the ICC is complementarity. Uh, but once, uh, and of course, the, the, the responsibility to investigate and prosecute primarily will always remain with states, always. But if states are not doing that, and they belong to this institution, where which they have given the power to investigate and prosecute when they are not able or they are not willing to do so, they should support the institution to be able to do it. And uh, otherwise, Justice will not be done at home and will not be done before the institution that they are part of. We, we need to avoid that. Thank you for those comments, Chief Prosecutor. And uh, I certainly hope that you'll also have the, the, the person, the body of a certain Mr. Omar al-Bashir um, with you in The Hague before uh, too much longer in the, in the future. Um, we are over time already. So I'm, I'm just going to say, uh, James, Karen, any comments you'd like to make on that question of surrender and the question also about, uh, I guess, essentially about how uh, international justice can be preventive in, in looking at the situation in Palestine. Let, let's go with you first, James, and then I'll come to you, Karen, for last word. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much, and I'll be brief. Look, at in relation to Palestine, Israel, um, there's so much one could say, um, uh, and, and as you say, very little time Ireland's approach to this conflict over the decades uh, is based on respect for international law. There are agreed parameters, including relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Um, the Security Council, we know, past days, weeks, you know, has been meeting in constant session uh, in relation to, to, to Palestine, Israel, uh, with, no, with no product, if I may put it that crudely. And I'll come back to that in a moment, accountability. Um, of course, Ireland is... is very supportive of the work of the ICC. Uh, we don't comment on ongoing judicial processes, but we are very supportive of the wise decisions, 
the independent impartial decisions taken by the prosecutor and by the, the, the judges in relation to Palestine. And we will support uh, the work of the court there. It's yeah. key, what's key for us in this situation, as in any other situation, is the rights of the victims. It's the rights of both the Palestinian and the Israeli peoples. I mean, more generally, in terms of accountability, uh, you know, this is absolutely core. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we cannot stand idly by. Um, and, you know, Ireland has been very supportive over the years of of efforts to restrict the use of the veto to an appropriate use of the veto. It's a, it's a very important power. Mm -hmm. All of the five permanent members have used it over the years or have threatened to use it. And, and therefore, you know, you can't always go with a resolution that's going to be vetoed, but sometimes you must. But we have we have particularly supported the, you know, the ACT code of conduct, the, the French Mexican initiative. Um, cooperation with the ICC has always been core for us. A former ambassador to the Netherlands, Mary Whelan, was coordinator on cooperation. We led work at the Kampala Review Conference on cooperation. And we're now currently one of the regional uh, focal points on non-cooperation uh, based uh, really through my colleagues in New York. So, so cooperation is absolutely key uh, as a legal obligation and, 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 and more than that. Karen has already mentioned, of course, uh, complementarity. And as we all know, there's a, you know, a plethora of other uh, courts, tribunals and bodies that, that we have supported, uh, including you know, the international mechanisms in Myanmar and Syria who are doing vital work. UN has concentrated a lot, a lot of time to put it mildly uh, in relation to accountability in Palestine. Um, but I suppose just touching again on complementarity, you know, there, there's a couple, there's three, I'll mention just three and then I'll stop. Universal jurisdiction exercised prudently and in accordance with international law is vital. Uh, the International Law Commission has proposed what we think is a very good basis for diplomatic negotiations in relation to a crimes against humanity, which concentrates on both prevention uh, as well uh, as punishment. So they must work together. And then there is an excellent uh, and not high profile enough uh, initiative for an agreement on, on uh, mutual legal assistance and extradition uh, being brought forward by Argentina, Belgium, uh, Mongolia, Netherlands, uh, Senegal and Slovenia. And that's absolutely key to enabling states to do their bit. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking up too much time, but the, the questions posed are, are so big. Thank you. No, I, I, I'm sorry, James. It, big questions and with little amount of time. Karen, you get the last word here today. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, there's not much left to say about those two questions. I think that the other two speakers have done such a good job of, of answering them much more comprehensively than I could. And of course, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't come from that, that perspective. So maybe... Maybe what I would like to say is just with regards to the question about, you know, what do you do when it comes to obstacles such as the failure of, of, of states to surrender those who've been indicted? I, I think that to me speaks to a broader question around, you know, the, the political and other challenges that, that um, interna international justice faces and, and not just, you know, mechanisms and institutions like the ICC, but, but everybody who's trying to, um, you know, achieve international justice. I think uh, it just reminds all of us, uh, also those who are, you know, critical of um, bodies like the ICC, that you know we're not, we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, everything is political, and everything is politicized. And you know, if if everybody could go about their business and and you know uh, conduct legal affairs in in the perfect way that you might learn how to do it at universities, you know, that would be a different story. Um, but that's not how the world works. And and I think you know we have to. Uh, sadly, rely in the work that we do, we re rely, and we've heard that today, we rely very, very heavily on the support of states. Yeah. And, and, you know, that comes with, with all the problems and, uh, and, and the challenges that, uh, you know, 193 members of the United Nations, uh, you know, come with. Uh, and so I think that's just important to point out that, you know, everybody, everybody's, uh, trying to do what they can. I mean, also in the case of maybe bringing it back to the question about uh, what's going on in, in, uh, in Palestine at the moment. Um, so, you know, just from the perspective of my office, of course, this is something that we're working on. We have not yet released a statement that might be coming. Um, and that's something that I will discuss with my, uh, with my colleague, the special advisor on the prevention of genocide. But of course, re the release of statements is, is you know, one way in which we 
try to raise awareness about a situation. Um, but of course, there are many, many other things that are happening already simultaneously within the UN system. So working with different parts of the UN, um, working with member states, working with regional organizations. A lot of this also happens behind the scenes. Um, so it's not often things that one can always share. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Karen. And, and we are very, we're long over time and I'm very sorry um, for, for keeping people detained, if, we, if I can use that word. But let me just say, as we have heard today, you know, the connection between international justice, atrocity prevention and R2P is unbreakable. You know, I want to thank very much, of course, the Chief Prosecutor, Ms. Fatou Bensouda, for your time today and for your insightful remarks. And again, for the, the long years you have spent you know, at the ICC battling against tremendous odds. Uh, sometimes it seemed attacked from all sides and you're just always such a champion of human rights and international justice. I wanna thank also, of course, Karen Smith and, and James Kingston for your reflections. Thanks to the Permanent Mission of Ireland and to Ambassador Bern Nason for uh, their support in hosting this event. Thanks to Jahan and Christine from the Global Center who made it all happen. And thank you, of course, very much to our audience uh, around the world who have tuned in. Thank you all.